love trains, so that was like, oh, <laughs> it feels good. So does the love train, by the way. Um, so we are doing um, the um, Gandhi to King season for nonviolence. It's 64 days, and each week we are talking about another individual who has lived by example for the rest of us of how we can be in the world. And so today we are going to talk about the, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. And, you know, a couple things that I, when I was reading about him that I kind of went, I wonder what that was like. So his mother and father were peasant farmers. And when the Don, Dalai Lama was two years old, monks showed up at their door and said, you have the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, the 13th Dalai Lama. We are taking your child. I know. It's kind of, as a mother, I'm thinking, okay. And they, you know, they say in the book that the family was very honored that, um, that they had given birth to this, to this being, this spiritual being. And yet I think, wow. You know, as a mother, wow. And then when he was four years old, they wrapped him in red robes and said, you are the leader of Tibetan Buddhism. Four. He was four. So how did he learn compassion? You might think it was from the monks. You might think it was from all of his teaching. It was from a parrot. <laughs> he said he learned compassion as a little boy who was, you know, and you look at the Dalai Lama now and what do you think of this laughing, jovial, wonderful soul. And yet when he was a little boy, he was really unhappy. And I imagine some of that came with, um, he had a lot of responsibility, more than I'll ever have in a lifetime at four. And he was being instructed from the time he was four on what it meant to be the Dalai Lama. And so he was always in school. So he said he doesn't remember having a happy childhood, except for this parrot. And he wanted this parrot to be his friend. So he tried being very nice to the parrot, and the parrot wanted nothing to do with him. So he said, then he got a stick, and he thought he'd punish the parrot for not being his friend. And that's when he learned compassion, because what he learned was, then the parrot not only didn't want anything to do with him, when he'd entered the room, the parrot would fly away. And so it was a great, great lesson for this young boy. When he was 15, his country was invaded by China. 15. 15 years old, and he needs to decide how he is going to face China. Now, um, there were 6 million Tibetans, and we know how big China is. And so he was in negotiations with China, trying to explain to them um, why they didn't want Tibet, why it was sacred ground, why it was their home why they should be there. And while he is in negotiations, there are a lot of atrocities happening to his people. And so one day in 1955, his people decided they were going to gather in protest. 60,000 Tibetans against a Chinese army. And that's when he decided to save his people. He would leave Tibet. Because he knew if he left, they would not protest. And so he walked from Tibet to India, where he still considers himself the longest visitor ever in India. He does not consider it his home. He's very grateful for, um, for the love that they have showed him. He's very grateful he has been able to create sanctuaries and monasteries in Tibet that mirror what he had I mean, in China, that in India, that mirror what he had when he was in Tibet, except that is not his home. So what does he really teach us? What he really teaches us is compassion. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't know how many of us, if we got thrown out, well, just imagine, take an everyday situation that one of us might face. Uh, we get fired from a job. We get evicted from an apartment. Somebody we think the adores us says, I am so done with this relationship now. Would we not want to hold them hostage? Would we not want to make them wrong? 
and tell everybody we know how this person has done this and that person has done that and you know all that story and he has no story about the Chinese the only thing is he has said is he knew millions of Chinese warriors were coming to invade his country he knew there were billions of Chinese people that were showing compassion to somebody in their land to their neighbor to their family to someone um, other than these people that were instructed to invade. So he holds nobody hostage. And when you think about that, you know, that's one of those awe, wow, really moments. And the most awe moment to me is he's still walking this planet. You know, it's not um, Jesus, it's not Gandhi. It's not uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and, and some of those lost their life way early, except it's somebody who is still an a living example for each and every one of us. How do we live compassion? What are the principles behind that? And so there's some steps that we can take. And you know, one of the first steps is create a morning ritual for yourself. And you may think, oh, you know, do I have to set out Buddhas and angels and you know whatever that is not necessarily you know I was told one time when I when I said in a ministerial class I have no morning ritual and she said what do you do every morning when you get up I said my husband makes coffee and I sit down and we watch John Stewart together she said guess what that's a ritual that is a ritual now I do something before that I mean I, I wake up and I meditate and I journal and but that is part of that ritual. So what do you do in the morning to wake up the day? How do you say, oh, thank you, God, I'm breathing. Thank you, God, I'm living in Santa Fe. Thank you, God, the sun is shining. What do you do every morning? Because I know, I don't know about um, other countries, how they do it. I know in this country, many of us, like I used to, I used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I was in my car at 5.30, and I was at my desk in Seattle at 6. Yes, I drove very fast. I lived 30 minutes outside of Seattle, and I got there just a little, and that traffic was the only thing that slowed me down. So, um, you know, I, if you want to call that a ritual, I call it panic. You know, I was in a state of panic all the time. Was I going to get up in time? Was I going to be dressed in time? Was I going to run into traffic? I put my makeup in the car. Do you know how... Well, some women do. You know, 70 miles an hour putting on your mascara. You're, you know, you're, yeah, I know, see? You're worried sometimes you're going to pop your eye out. Um, and if you're driving around me, you're probably worried I was going to drive into you. Fortunately, I never did. However, I don't think that that's necessarily, energetically, a healthy way to be in the world. You know, did I do that? Yes, I absolutely did. And, and I did it because I really didn't know any better at the time. You know, my job, I felt, was my source. It was my money. And so I didn't get that, my source is that divine who has brought that job to me. I thought, my, I thought at and was my source. And I better be there on time every single day. And so, um, you know, you learn to shift. And the Dalai Lama is a great example of that. His ritual is to wake up in the morning and really say how wonderful it is to be alive with a big smile on his face. You know, that's a simple ritual. You don't need candles. You don't need anything. Just remember when you wake up, ah, smile. I'm so grateful for today. Because remember, every day, every moment's brand new. You've never lived it before. And guess what? You're never going to get to live it again. Every Sunday we come here, even if we're the same people every Sunday, and we're sitting in the same chairs, it's different. We have visitors. We've got new songs. We've got a different prayer. Somebody else leading something differently. Every day we're different. And so remembering that and giving thanks. Oh, I have a brand new baby day. An opportunity to be different today than I was yesterday. An opportunity to be love instead of expecting love. Oh. Oh, yeah. To be love instead of expecting love. And so the second uh, way to practice compassion is through empathy. 
And that is, we all have a story, do we not? We all have a story. And our story usually is about suffering. <laughs> is it not? We don't, I mean, you know, maybe if we get to know somebody long enough, we'll start to share the good in our life. But normally, what we share, first of all, is, oh, you know, something has happened to me right now, and I need to talk to somebody about that. So we're sharing our, in the Buddhist tradition, that would be called suffering. We are sharing our suffering. And I'm not saying we don't suffer, because yes, we do. We have different things that happen in our life that are unfair, unkind, whatever you want to call it. And so we are going to hit those spots. However, I think that a lot of us out of habit, habit just share our suffering. And some of it's just, oh my goodness, Gail, it's just life. It's not real suffering, it's life. <clears throat> and so empathy is, instead of me sharing, is to look out at somebody that may be really suffering and put myself in their shoes and wonder, how did they get up this morning and take a breath? How this morning did, were they able to, um, to just smile? How does the Dalai Lama get up every day knowing he is exiled from his own country and they're strip mining it? How does he wake up every day and smile and say, I am so grateful. Because he knows, he knows that there's always somebody suffering and his compassion is, it's not about me. How can I help somebody else? How can I be of service? Because I believe that's why we're all here. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we really were all in service to each other? Wow, be a great big healing going on, I think. Great big healing going on. And so how do we do that? How do we notice if somebody's brokenhearted or something really is um, happening in their life that we're not aware of? You know, I think the eyes, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. It's a good place to start. Which means that, uh oh Gail, you can't be looking at your cell phone. I can't see your eyes if I'm looking down playing trivia crack. <laughs> <laughs> or words with friends or whatever other thing I have now loaded onto my phone. <laughs> so, you know, it's really looking into somebody's eyes to see, you know, what's going on in their life. How are they feeling right now? And how you do that instead of looking at somebody and saying, oh, look, that person has red hair and I have brown hair, or that person is five feet three and I'm five feet ten, or that person is so slender and I'm so overweight, or whatever those are, because that's where we tend to go. What if we looked at that person and thought, wow, I bet she's a lot like me in more ways than I could ever know. I bet that somewhere in her or his life, somebody's probably broken her heart or his heart. I bet that's happened. We can't go through this human experience probably without our heart being broken, at least once. Even if it was a bad relationship, when it breaks, trust me, your heart's a little broken. And so finding out what, how are we common instead of how are we different is huge in practicing compassion. Instead of looking at somebody and saying, oh, you know, that person's living on the street in a sleeping bag, um, looking at that, first of all, that's a human person and probably has some suffering going on in their life. I wonder how I could be of help. And what I have found the kindest thing to do is to smile <coughs> at them and say hello and notice that they're really human instead of walking by like they don't exist. And I know I've been there. You know, don't ask me for money, so if I don't look at you, you won't ask me for money. Really, how hard is it to say to somebody, I'm sorry, I don't have any change right now. You can still look at them. You can still smile. You can still acknowledge that they too are the power and presence of God. So look for the similarities. It's really how we get to that place of compassion and love. And then I love this because um, 
Do you remember the movie, um, and I, I think it ended actually sadly, but it was Random Acts of Kindness, the little boy that started that in his school? And so the other thing is basically acts of kindness, only make them random. Pay it forward. Yeah, pay it forward. But it was based on random acts of kindness, and there's actually a Facebook page now called Pay It Forward, and I think there's one called Random Acts of Kindness. And it really is every day, how can I choose to be kind? How can I choose to be kind? And what that looks like to each one of us is different. How many times have we gone through um, a checkout line and not even <coughs> noticed what the person who is waiting on us looks like? And I know that if you say, hello, how's your day going? Sometimes they're going to look right through you because they don't, they're so used to being invisible that when somebody sees them, I think it kind of shocks them. <laughs> but an act of kindness is to really notice people and give thanks for what they're doing. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, if you're a volunteer here, stand up. In any capacity. Practitioners, core counsel, volunteers, hello. So look around because I truly, this community is blessed by your service. So thank you. And they do that from their heart. You know, they don't get paid for volunteering. I guess that's why it's called volunteering. <laughs> but they do that because they love this community so much, they give up their time and talent. And that's huge. I remember when I first went to my first Science of Mind community, and I knew nothing about volunteering. I just knew I needed to change my life, so I went in there like a bulldozer and said, just give me something to do. <laughs> and, you know, Reverend Susie said, you have become my poster child for volunteering. And so it is a gift that you give to a community, whatever that community is, wherever you are, however much you can give, is just by helping support it through volunteering. It's how we survive. And how do I know that? Because when this was in my house, Paul and a couple of renditions after that, Paul and I used to do this all by ourselves. And trust me, I sleep better at night now. It's, it's very relaxing for me not to have to worry about making the coffee or are the dishes in the right place or are the programs ready and is somebody going to be here to hand them out? It's like, wow, I get to be the minister. Oh, what a treat. Kind of scary too, just so you know. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> and then the last thing is, much like your ritual when you start your day, you should have a ritual to end your day. And the ritual to end your day is to go back and look over your day before you go to bed. And say, is there any place I could have been kinder? Is there some place I could have been more compassionate? Is there any place where I would really like to have a do-over? And then, if it's something that you don't know the person and you realize you could have been more compassionate, energetically, you know, say, wow, I wish I would have noticed when I was going through the line that I didn't smile and say hello. I promise to do better tomorrow. You don't have to go seek people out. Unless you've really done some verbal damage, then it might be a good idea. <laughs> you know, so. And then I wanted to end, and I was so excited when I saw Cynthia walk in. Cynthia Lucas, stand up for a second, please. Cynthia is a producer, writer, and lecturer, and poet here in Santa Fe. And, um, I have a blog that gets posted on, and thanks for joining us. I have a blog that gets posted on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to actually get it in your email, you can sign up on our webpage under news and blog and enter your email in. And right now I'm doing the season of nonviolence. And so um, Cynthia, like me, is really touched by this 64 day process of how do I um, change who I am in this process? How do I decide to be like, these great people that have walked this earth. How can I embrace that as who I am? And so she um, sent this to me, and I wrote back and said, could I share it on Sunday? And she said yes. And it started out, actually, dear friends, and at first I was going to write to her and say, who wrote this? And then it dawned on me, she did. <laughs> <laughs> so we, as we speak about Gandhi and King on college campuses and in communities, we are always asked, where is the next Gandhi? 
Where is the next king? I believe there are among us sung and sometimes unsung, stepping forward, not waiting for another Gandhi, another king, another Mandela, another Mother Teresa, another Jesus, another anyone. They step forward because they know they must. They step forward in sacred trust. Like Gandhi, they see the divine in everyone. Like King, they believe in the equality of everyone to live lives of dignity and purpose. So they step forward with the courage of a Gandhi and the resolve of a King to alleviate the suffering of the smallest, the weakest, the poorest of the poor, the unnamed, with compassion. They step forward as others look away, or perhaps run away in the opposite direction. The next Gandhi is us. The next king is our conscious collective who reacts with compassion to the entire human family and uplifts the most insignificant with love. Oh. Namaste. Namaste.